my family and I recently moved away from the city. Settling in a gorgeous house in the middle of a developing neighborhood. Our house was one of the first to be built in the area. So, aside from a couple of other houses, there wasn't many people around yet. Instead, we were surrounded by a vast ocean of trees and greenery, untouched by the hand of man. I first noticed it when I left my house one morning to go on a run. I suffered from depression, an invisible illness that my parents never took seriously, until they found me in the hospital drunk and disoriented. I had tried to throw myself in the middle of a busy road, ranting about wanting to end it all. Luckily for me, my friends were able to wrestle me down, and someone called an ambulance. That's one of the main reasons we moved so far away from the city, so we could spend more time as a family recovering. I was always restless, so I would often wake up at dusk and go on a jog to sort out my thoughts. I would grab my earbuds and a windbreaker, and quietly enter in the security pin for the alarm system and head out. The air was cool and crispy, full of microscopic drops of the last night's storm. Although it was the middle of summer, it felt more like fall. I started off with a light jog, running down the street full of half-finished houses and out into the trees. The closest thing to nature I ever got was Central Park, back when we lived in the city. Unlike Central Park, however, there is no pavement full of cyclists or random tourists taking pictures everywhere. It was just me and the sounds of crickets, swaying trees and the cacophony of birds. Eventually, I got tired and decided to stop near a fallen tree. I leaned back against the log and sat down, taking a sip from my water bottle. I looked around a little before putting on my earbuds. As nice as nature was, my thoughts and memories were overpowering the scenery. All I kept thinking about was the day our life turned to hell. It was barely a year since the incident, but I could still remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had to go out to work like always and I stayed home to take care of my little brother, Diego. I was in charge of watching him ever since I was little. I would wake him up, feed him, bathe him, and help him with his homework. I would drop him off on my way to school and pick him up. One morning, I woke up to find him still on the kitchen floor, surrounded by a mess of flour and other ingredients. He had tried to make some breakfast and choked on a slice of banana. He choked because I didn't wake up in time. His death was on me. And now my baby brother was gone. I was so deep in my thoughts that I didn't notice the music had stopped in my earbuds, instead being replaced by a faint static. Sissy, leave. A very faint and familiar voice had whispered through the static. It almost sounded like Diego's voice. I tried to raise the volume on my phone, but when I pulled my phone out, it shut off. I tried to turn it back on, but it only displayed the message of low battery. Weird, I always charge my phone overnight. I took off my earbuds and put them back in their case when I heard a branch snap to my right. I looked over and saw a little boy wearing Bob the Builder pajamas. It was Diego. It couldn't be. I had to be dreaming. His big innocent brown eyes stared up at me and with his finger he motioned me to follow him. I wanted to follow him, but something wasn't right about this entire situation. The area had gone completely silent. The birds and even the insects had left. There wasn't even wind. The hairs in the back of my neck had started to stand up, and my heart was pounding faster. I looked away from his direction and I ran towards home. As I ran, I looked back and saw that the area was empty. I made it home, out of breath, but I didn't care, as long as I was away from that place. I spent the rest of the day distracting myself until my parents came home from work. And when they did, I didn't mention anything out of the ordinary. 
I didn't need to give them another reason to diminish their perspective of me. I laid in bed that night, thinking about what I saw. I probably dreamt it all. I was tired. It was probably grief. I kept thinking about ways to rationalize what I saw, but I knew deep down that what I saw was real. And the next morning, I went downstairs into the kitchen where my parents were sitting down and making breakfast. So, how are you settling in? My father asked while scraping his fork around these scrambled eggs on his plate. We have another month before school starts. Your father and I were wondering if you wanted to go camping. My mother said awkwardly while stirring the spoon in her cup of coffee. She had a tendency to fidget when she was nervous. Yeah, it would be nice to do something as a family before you start school. Plus, we could explore this area a little bit. My father reiterated. If that's okay with you. My mother raising an eyebrow while taking a sip on her coffee. I merely nodded while sitting down to pick at the eggs in front of me. For a brief second, I remembered about yesterday's events. But I was disrupted by my parents' awkward conversation. I think we should go this weekend. I checked the forecast and the weather should be perfect this weekend. I hear there's a campsite close by. My mother continued on while my father continued picking at his eggs. In that case, I think we should start packing and gathering up camping stuff. I think I'm going to run into town for a quick bit later today and get the rest of these supplies. Okay. My mom added, agreeing with my father. The rest of the day went by smoothly with my parents gone. I spent all day just lying in bed and going on social media. The clock app made it super easy for me to distract myself from the complete silence of the house. And when Diego was around, there was never any silence. He would always blast the TV or play really loud music. Now there's too much. I eventually drifted off to sleep. The next two days were the same as the previous ones. I would lay in bed browsing more social media, trying to distract myself from my own brain. Eventually, Friday arrived, and we soon found ourselves on the road on our way to the campsite my parents had talked about. The drive there wasn't that long, but it felt like an eternity with the utter silence. If this was the way it was going to be, I was already counting down the seconds. The actual campsite was nothing special. It was a flat area with several wooden tables and empty fire pits. But the area surrounding it, it was covered in a light mist that made it a little eerie due to the trees limiting our vision outside of the campground. Why is it so misty? My mother asked with worry on her face. Do you think it's going to rain? My father shook his head while gently parking across the site. Nah, the forecast didn't show any signs of rain. It's probably the mist coming in from the lake nearby since it's still early morning. How far away are we from home? I asked, looking around at the trees. And the trees looked much different than the ones that surrounded our house. These were taller and looked like pine trees. We're not that far from home. Maybe 30 minutes away. Why? My father asked while putting his phone away. Well, the trees are different. Oh, I didn't notice, my mother replied. All right, come help me get out the supplies and set up the tent. Hey, where is everyone? My mother asked. What do you mean? It's completely empty. You would think there would be other people around here. Who knows, maybe a lot of people don't camp around here. Regardless, we're here now, so we should set up the tent. My father stated, his tone turning serious. Alright. My mother motioned me to help her move the poles around, while she took out the plastic flaps of the tent. It took us a bit, but we managed to set up the tent while my father set up a fire on one of the camp grills. He started to grill some meats when my mother interrupted him. Wait, aren't there bears or something? I think I read somewhere that we shouldn't have food on us. Or maybe we should set up the tent far away from the area that we're cooking. It beats me. 
There's a reason the campgrounds have you set up. I don't think it's bears that we have to watch out for. My father scoffed. Okay, but what about all the other animals? My mother asked, much to my annoyance. She just had to keep asking questions. But she was kind of right. Well, the meat is already cooked, so let's eat lunch and move on. My father could never back down, even if he knew he was in the wrong. We ate on one of the picnic tables under the now blazing sun. The area was pretty empty, but the scenery was gorgeous. The trees were massive, but yet we could still see the peaks of the mountains in the far distance. It's so pretty here. I think we should go on a hike, my mother insisted, snapping me back to reality. We finished up pretty quick and gathered some bottles of water and began to follow one of the trails nearby. My father kept talking about the scenery while my mother just asked random questions here and there. I know they tried to maintain some semblance of normality, but honestly, it kind of irked me that they tried to act like nothing was wrong. I felt like my anger was festering and bottling up and I wanted to yell and scream at them, but that thought was quickly forgotten when we heard rustling to our left. You think that's a deer? My mother asked. Uh, I'm not sure. My father's words were quickly cut off by the figure in the Bob the Builder pajamas that approached us. It was Diego once again, except this time he stopped for a bit before running across the path in front of us and darting back into the woods. We stood in complete silence before I spoke up. Diego? I asked, my vision becoming blurry with the tears that were forming in my eyes. No, that wasn't him. My mother snapped. That was someone else's kid. He's probably lost or something. My father shook his head and looked around. No, Shonda, that was definitely our son. It can't be, my mother insisted. Before we could utter another word, a large gust of wind blew on all of us, causing the trees to sway back and forth. But it wasn't the sound of the trees that sent a chill down our core, but the cries of several people all around us. I tried looking around, but I couldn't see anyone. It was getting louder and louder to the point that it was getting hard to hear my parents. What the heck is going on? My mother cried out, the wind whipping her hair around. Oh, we have to leave. My father grabbed my mother's hand and tried running towards the path back. I ran after them and we kept running until we no longer heard the crying wails. What the heck just happened? I cried out. I don't know, but we have to go back. Screw this place. My father cursed as we walked. My mother was completely silent. We must have walked for at least an hour before I spoke up. Why do I feel like we walked further than we should have? Yeah, I noticed that too. Are we even on the right path? I asked. Kristen, don't be an idiot. The path was straight and how the heck could we get lost? My father snapped at me. Gosh, I was just trying to help. If you want to help, use your phone to see where we are. I quietly took my phone out and tried to open up the map, but it kept saying that there was no location available. It won't let me. I said meekly, trying to avoid another one of his insults. Give it to me. Useless, he bickered. He grabbed it out of my hands and played around with it before throwing it back to me. Frick here. Keep trying, let's just keep walking. We walked another couple of hours before we could no longer see anything as the sun was starting to set. And it got dark pretty fast. Too fast. And pretty soon, it was pitch black. I was about to ask another question but decided to keep my mouth shut because I was scared of getting yelled at. All of a sudden, the whales started up again. But in the trail in front of us, we saw a bunch of hooded figures walking towards us. Hey, what the heck do you want? Who are you people? My father yelled at them. I looked at my mother who was in complete shock as she cowered up behind him. As they got closer, I could see that there was something off about them. They were taller than the average person, and they walked gracefully. 
Their heads didn't bop up and down like a person when they walked. I looked down and saw that they were almost gliding over the ground. They were floating. I felt my body tense up, but I motioned to my father to look down, and he bolted into the woods, dragging my mother along with him. I tried to keep up with them, looking back every so often to see that they stood still, just watching us run away. There was something so wrong about them. I looked in front of me, but I could no longer see my parents. Mom, Dad, I yelled out. I can't see you guys, please wait. I began to hyperventilate, and I took out my phone and activated the flashlight, but it was so dark that the light barely helped. I walked and walked and soon found myself in front of a wrecked and rusted car. The windows were long busted, but the doors were still closed. I quietly opened one and crawled inside. I cried in complete silence, telling myself that I would just have to wait until morning to begin to walk back to the campground. I just had to hang on until the morning. I tried calling the police, but my phone wouldn't let any phone calls go through. It was acting pretty strange, only letting me use certain apps like this one. I'm not sure where I am to be honest. I just have to wait for a couple of more hours until the sun comes up. It's 8am and the sun still hasn't come up yet. It's completely dark. There's not even the sign of the moon. I stayed in the safety of the wrecked car, just waiting for any sign of my parents but nothing. I couldn't even hear the cries of any birds. It was like time stood completely still. I couldn't get any sleep last night, so I sat there in the car just browsing my phone, looking at past pictures of me and Diego. Oddly enough, my battery had stayed the same percentage as when I got lost. My phone wouldn't allow any calls, texts, and didn't even show my location. Eventually, I felt a little brave enough to venture out into the forest to look for my parents or even a way out. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and I started walking. It was so dark that even the light of my phone did little to reveal the obstacles that stood before me. I walked and walked until my legs were on fire, but there was still no sign of any clearing. It was like there was no end to the massive sea of trees. Right as I was about to start running and yelling, my phone's flashlight started flickering. I looked down at my phone before it eventually shut off randomly. It was like the battery died, but the last thing I saw, it wasn't even close to dying. Kristen, sweetie, is that you? I heard my mother's voice hiss in a slight whisper. I looked to my left, but I couldn't see anything in the pitch black darkness. Mom, is that you? Suddenly, I felt hands grabbing my shoulders and I could hear my mom's arms wrap around mine. Oh, Christy, you're safe. We thought we lost you. My mother whispered into my ear. You should have kept up with us. My father's gruff voice broke the stillness of the environment around us. I held on to my mother's arms as we walked through the forest together. Nothing about this situation makes any sense. Before my phone had died, it said it was 8am but there was no sign of the sun coming up. The sky is pitch black too. I whispered to my mom, Just shut and let's keep walking. We're bound to find the campsite sometime soon. My father insisted. Sweetie, I do. My mother's voice was quickly cut off by the sound of those awful wails from before. It was so loud that I couldn't hear what my parents were yelling, but I could feel myself being dragged along as we ran away. I looked around, but it was so dark that I couldn't pinpoint anything in my line of vision. It almost sounded like the whales were coming from all around us now. We spotted a small clearing of what seemed like a small campfire up ahead, and as we got closer, it seemed like the whales were starting to die down. Just as I had started to get some semblance of safety, it was quickly shattered by the realization that there were three of those figures sitting around the campfire. They were facing us, but they were sitting with their legs crossed. 
but their hoods were covering their faces so we couldn't see them. I stood behind my mother as my father gently walked up to me, ready to fight them. Who the heck are you people? He growled at them. I hunched over my mother's shoulder to get a better view and tried to get a better view of them too. They were so completely still that for a brief second I thought they were mannequins. They weren't even moving to breathe. Don't you he- My father's words were quickly cut off when he yanked the hoods off one of their faces. It was a person. If they were wearing a porcelain mask that lacked any features other than its lips. My father crouched beside them and started to pick off their mask. I'm not sure what he must have seen, but it caused him to fall back on the floor. What the heck are you? He yelled. His voice had now changed from hostility to utter terror. My mother tried to shield me away, but I pushed her arms aside and got a look at what he was facing. The person, or whatever that thing was, had a wide smile full of shark-like teeth, but that wasn't the only thing that unnerved me. It had no eyes. I don't mean that there were empty holes in its eye sockets. It looked like there were straight up no eyelids or anything, yet somehow it knew to look at my father's direction. I'm glad you came to join us, Mr. Clarkson. Ed said with a slight growl and a sick smile. The others began to remove their masks, and I looked at them. I couldn't help but be completely disturbed. The one in the middle had all twisted features, white, translucent reptilian skin and eyes that were completely black, and that same creepy shark-like teeth. But the one on its left had no mouth, similar to the one that had no eyes. Everything else was the same, though. Ah, uh, Mrs. Clarkson and Kristen Clarkson. We have the entire family here. Well, almost. Where's your son? I believe his name is Diego. The other one spoke while the one without a mouth just nodded. My father grabbed a random stick and ran towards them, ready to try and take one down. But as soon as he got within heading distance, all three of us were slammed into the ground by some invisible force. My father was thrown backwards and into the floor, whereas my mother and I were thrown onto our knees and the three, three of us were dragged right in front of all three of them. I felt a sharp pain throughout the skin of my knees. I wanted to cry in terror, but I felt too petrified to even move another muscle. From my peripheral vision, I could see my father struggle against the invisible forest, but it was a futile attempt. So, tell me, Clarksons, why is it that your youngest son is not with you? The eyeless one asked, feigning concern, but I could see that his tone reeked with sarcasm. He died in an accident, my mother cried out. Don't lie. The one in the middle yelled out angrily. He turned to the one without a mouth and noticed that instead of the pointy ears that the other had, it was just blank, like he never developed them at all. The one without a mouth merely nodded his head sadly and looked down at the floor. The wails from the forest had started up again, getting louder and louder until I could feel the strong wind blow on us, yet the fire remained lit. These souls of the forest had cry out for blood. They despise the fragility and flaws of man. Should we give them what they want, or will you speak the truth? I could hear the anger in the eyeless one's tone as he spoke. Tell us, what happened to Diego Clarkson? The earless one demanded. I'm real. My mother's cries were interrupted by my father's harsh words. Shut the heck up, Chandra. They don't know anything. The mouthless one got up and walked over to my father, putting his scaly claws on his forehead, slightly cutting open his skin. My father winced in pain, but couldn't do anything to stop it. What about you, Kristen? What happened on that day? The eyeless one asked. Tears walled up in my eyes as I tried to recall that day. I woke up late and didn't notice that he had tried to make some breakfast. He died because he had choked on something. I cried out, hoping that it would be enough for them to let us go. What really happened that day? 
he demanded angrily. That's all that happened, please, I swear. I cried out, hoping for mercy. Really, you saw him choking. The earless one scoffed at my words. I nodded my head. The truth was, right after I saw his body on the floor, I called the ambulance and my parents had to be called in from work. I knew right away that he was no longer alive. His eyes were wide open. What about you, Shonda? Got anything to add? The eyeless one questioned. I'm sorry, Chrissy. My mother cried out. I'm really sorry. Her cries were almost joining the chorus of the wails coming from all around us. What are you sorry about? I asked in confusion. My parents had to work and I was in charge of my brother. It was my responsibility. We knew he had died before you did. Daddy and I had stayed home that morning. We were just a little stressed out the night before so we took something to have a sleep. My mother was cut off by the sound of gurgling and coming from her. Enough lies. The deaf one yelled furiously at her. The more you lie, the stronger the hold gets. The eyeless one spoke. Come on, Shonda. We did coke. We were freaking coked out of our minds the night before and we left some out in the kitchen. Diego got in and overdosed while we were all asleep. It was like time had frozen once again for me. I tried to remember that day again. Every time I recalled that day, the only memory I had was his little body surrounded by flour and random stuff. I was sure that he was surrounded by flour, but it was freaking coke. How could my own parents let me feel guilty this entire year? But why wouldn't they be locked up for child neglect at last? I knew they had money, but I didn't know they had enough to buy off some freaking lowlife cops. That explains why we moved away. They didn't move me out to the middle of nowhere because they wanted to recover. They were running away from the truth. They killed Diego. How could you? I screamed out, trying to push through whatever was gripping onto me to try to attack those two. Now, now. The eyeless one spoke. Giving in to your anger does little to help our situation, Missy. What would little Diego say? The deaf one questioned while giving off a slight smirk. That sick idiot was getting some twisted pleasure out of this. Screw you, I yelled out angrily. I didn't care anymore about any of this. I wanted to hurt someone and I didn't care who. Sissy, I heard a little voice ask from my left. I turned and saw that from the woods a little figure in blue pajamas had emerged. Diego. My mother's cries had come to a stop as she questioned the little boy in front of us. Diego, come to mama. Right as she had said those words, he ran to my side and hugged me so tight that I could feel the warmth of his little body. I didn't understand how this was possible, but I didn't care. I hugged him back so tight because I was scared that he would disappear. I'm so sorry, I cried into his shoulders, covering his pajamas in the stains of my snot. I looked around to see that both my parents were still being held by the invisible forest, which was tightening its grip on them. You too will be let go. Go into the woods and do not look back. A soul for a soul. The eyeless one said, while the mouthless one pointed at the woods. The wails had died out completely leaving behind only the cries and moans of my parents. I grabbed Diego's hand, and we began to walk through the pitch black of the woods, not looking back at my parents. We walked and walked until we could no longer see the faint light of that campfire. We must have walked a while before I noticed that the sun had started coming up fairly quickly, until soon it was shining down on both of us. My phone had begun vibrating in my left pocket and we found ourselves back in the trail leading back to the campground. I walked inside the car with Diego and began to drive back home. I was so confused as to how my little brother had seemingly come to life. But when I checked back on my phone, I saw that I was swamped with the messages of my friends back home. Christy, I just wanted to see how you and Diego were holding up. Losing both your parents is hard so please let me know if you need anything. I can drive up there and help you with anything. Text me back. I was so confused as to how my friends knew about Diego's return. But when I checked their social media, I saw that they had linked an article about my parents' death one year ago. They both had died due to some overdose. 
I know it's crazy, but I remembered that phrase the eyeless one had said. A soul for a soul.